Good morning. Uh, my name is David Burton. I'm Senior Fellow in Economic Policy here at the Heritage Foundation. Welcome. Uh, it's been a constant source of amazement to me how if there's a snowflake in Washington, everybody panics. And I welcome you who were not panicked by the snowflakes, but uh, a fair number of people appear to have been. Uh, that, that's uh, well, it's climate change now, so either way it goes, it changes. So, uh, welcome to the sixth event in our speaker series, Free Markets, the Ethical Economic Choice. For those of you who would like to see what the future has to bring or to watch our previous events, many of which are truly of, of the highest quality, uh, go to heritage.org slash free dash market or free hyphen markets. Um, our subject today is capitalism is an information and learning system. Uh, but before I introduce our speaker, let me bring to your attention three upcoming events. Tomorrow at noon, Gregory May will be here to talk about his new book, Jefferson's Treasure, How Albert Gallatin Saved the New Nation from Debt. I would also like to bring to your attention the next two events in this series. On Friday, November 30th, Dr. Mike Munger, who is the Director of Philosophy, Politics, and Economics, uh, at the certificate program at Duke University, will speak on the subject of if poverty is the real problem, then capitalism is the only solution. On Tuesday, December 4th, John Allison, who is a retired chairman and CEO of BB&T Bank and the retired president of the Cato Institute, will speak on the philosophical fight for the future of America. Both of those events are at 11 o'clock. Our speaker today is George Gilder. He is a founder fellow of the Discovery Institute in Seattle, a venture investor in the United States and Israel, particularly focusing on high-tech companies, and has been a prominent thought leader in conservative economic circles for about four decades. He is the author of over 20 books on economics and technology, including Wealth and Poverty in 1981, he also wrote The Spirit of Enterprise, published in 1986, Knowledge and Power, published in 2013, and Life After Google, The Fall of Big Data and the Rise of the Blockchain Economy, published this year, and it's just back from China on a tour promoting that book. Mr. Gilder is a contributing editor of Forbes magazine and a contributor to a wide variety of publications over the year, including Wired and the Wall Street Journal. He's a graduate of Harvard University and edited the Ripon Forum, the newspaper of the Ripon Society. He started the United States Marine Corps, and he lives in Cheerium, Massachusetts, in the Berkshire Mountains. We'll have some time for audience questions after the presentation. Please join me in welcoming George Gilder. Thank you, David, and uh, great to be back, back here uh, in the States. Um, long, long flight from uh, Hong Kong yesterday. The issue of the morality of capitalism, I think, is often addressed in a misconceived way. Uh, it's not that uh, the arguments are wrong in any way. It's that the arguments miss the point of the protests. Uh, you know, they make utilitarian and efficiency arguments uh, in response to what is, in essence, a moral argument. And, and I think uh, in order to really address the subject of this series of lectures, it's, it's worth it to sort out the actual moral arguments involved in this issue, which requires us to go back to the prime figure in the history of capitalist ideology and, and analysis of Adam Smith, because Adam Smith really did uh, uh, set out the prevailing case for capitalism and analysis of its virtues and vectors of its advance. And Adam Smith was brilliant and wonderful in all the ways we understand, but also he was wrong. 
And so, uh, being wrong, uh, he set off conservative economics on a path which has rendered it ineffectual in defending the morality of capitalism. And I think this is uh, a key point. Adam Smith shared with academics in the United States and Britain a disdain for men in trade. Seldom did they gather but to conspire against the public interest. Uh, uh, and he issued a model of capitalism that uh, focused on efficiency rather than effectiveness. He, he uh, believed, for example, uh, erroneously, that the extent of the market is, I mean, the, uh, the division of labor, the proliferation of enterprise is determined by the extent of the market. And uh, this initial um, misconception has affected all of his thought and all capitalist thought since. It uh, renders the market somehow as standing outside enterprise, that the market is some kind of abstract entity that pre-exists pre enterprise, when there are no markets without entrepreneurs, and all the market institutions and the modes of transaction have all emerged from entrepreneurial activity. And, and so to say that uh, the market comes first, uh, the market and uh, entrepreneurs are somehow a function of forces outside them that, uh, that govern their behavior, I think is misconceived and it deprives entrepreneurs of full agency and creativity and, uh, and capability and as moral actors. Um, like many economists, uh, Adam Smith was attempting to uh, mimic physics. He wanted to, uh, you know, create a kind of grand determinist scheme like Isaac Newton a century before him, who had uh, transformed our whole vision of the universe and uh, kind of intoxicated uh, all the social sciences around them to try to mimic the great triumph of, of uh, Newtonian physics in uh, economics. And, and this results in the concept of homo economicus, which is really economic man. And economic man is supposedly a function of the forces that impinge on him. He uh, is a tool of incentives. He's, uh, he uh, responds to carrots and sticks. He, he, uh, he occupies, essentially, in uh, in the bare bones of the ideology, a, m a model of human personality summed up by the Skinner box, you know, the uh, belief of the Harvard uh, psychologists that human beings were a tabula rasa and uh, exclusively responding to incentives from outside them and forces impinging from behind outside them and seeking of pleasure and avoiding pain in an almost mechanical pattern. He thought that uh, if he uh, could uh, get her early enough, he could make Nancy Pelosi into a Republican. Uh, he thought he could make anybody into any, anything uh, if uh, you, he put them in a Skinner box and could completely control the environment they experienced. And the Skinner box, behavioralism has uh, been discredited across the domains of psychology. It survives chiefly as homo economicus in all the economic models that most people uh, study and entertain and which are the core of uh, most modern economics. And even, uh, we've had a couple wonderful Nobel Prizes recently, which uh, went to William Nordhaus 
and uh, Paul Romer. And uh, Paul Romer is a, a giant figure in entrepreneurial theory and, and really represents about the edge of the envelope in economic analysis in the universities for stressing the importance of the entrepreneur. But uh, hear how he defines the entrepreneur. An entrepreneur rearranges chemical elements. And because he believes the entrepreneur, that there are lots of chemical elements in a, a huge uh, combinatorial arena of possibilities in rearranging chemical elements, the entrepreneur has quite a lot of freedom under Romer's vision. But you see his see that his um, enlistment in the material of superstition is so powerful that he insists on making the uh, entrepreneur somehow a function of material forces outside him. He's, uh, he's rearranging chemical elements, which is about as trivial and ridiculous a way to describe what an entrepreneur does, as you can imagine. He's, he has better a vision of entrepreneurial creativity than most people. Um, uh, and it, it's, I'm not, I'm not, this is, you know, I admire these people. I'm just saying that it's, that uh, the culture of modern economics inexorably impels all these people to the materialist superstition, to reducing uh, human creativity to some kind of function of environmental forces and some configuration of incentives. So, uh, which leaves uh, the human mind pretty much uh, uh, just a product of the great machine as Adam Smith called it, of that uh, allocated everything with perfect refinement to its best use. And uh, it's a great, it sees the um, of entrepreneur as a, a function of the great machine. And, and now uh, under, under what I call Google Marxism, uh, the the great, uh, this, they believe that the human mind is a, is a great machine. And so the, uh, we're, uh, and we're about to eclipse the human mind with Google's computing machines uh, in a new singularity where uh, um, artificial intelligence and machine learning and all these capabilities um, are reach, uh, transcend human comprehension and capabilities and are capable of generating new and better machines in a cascade that flows out through the universe and uh, transforms the universe into a great Google machine while uh, uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin fly off to some nearby planet with Elon Musk in a winner-take-all universe, and the rest of us retire to the beaches and collect the guaranteed annual income as uh, um, a new fashion of Silicon Valley, that, because they imagine that their machines are an eschaton, a new final thing. Just as, as uh, Karl Marx imagined that his, uh, in the, all the mills and looms and turbines and, and uh, railroads and incipient electrical machines and steam engines were a final thing, an eschaton, uh, which would uh, 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 allow uh, uh, the problem of production to be permanently solved and uh, leaving uh, human beings to retire like country squires in the ideal of that era rather than going to beaches you uh, became uh, a lord 
and uh, you could uh, fish in the morning and, and raise cattle in the afternoon and write poems in the afternoon and be a critic in the evening, all paid for by the solution of the problem of production, rendering the challenge for politics no longer allowing the generation, the creation of wealth, but merely its redistribution. And Google Marxism really repeats that same uh, error, and it's uh, similarly delusional, and, there's, uh, and it's based on a fundamental misconception of how computers work and what they are. It's amazing how experts can be blind to the essence of their own machines, but that's but, the, but that is the case in this, uh, this era. So, so um, um, I think it's worthwhile really understanding how uh, econ economies really work rather than how this incentive economics is the Skinner box and the homo economicus depicts them as functioning. Um, so I've been working for uh, decades now on an information theory of capitalism, which uh, really redefines the, syst the system not as an incentive scheme, chiefly, but as a information system, and uh, and uh, using the same. Uh, mathematical structures that uh, have been developed uh, to uh, make possible the Google age in the computer industry and uh, the same information theory of it started essentially with Kurt Gödel in 1931 and proceeded on to Alan Turing both of them showed, they really founded the modern computer industry. Uh, Gödel showed in 1931 that any logical system, and a uh, computer is a logical system, any logical system is necessarily dependent on axioms that can't be proved within the system and, and that are outside the system, outside the box. And Alan Turing, took this essential Gödel model and turned it into a computer a schematic, uh, a Turing machine, which um, he said every Turing machine, in other words, abstract computer, is necessarily dependent on oracles, uh, human uh, programmers outside the computer structure itself. And so, uh, uh, Gödel, Gödel and Turing really laid the foundations of uh, the mo modern computer science together with uh, John von Neumann, and who was really the greatest uh, figure of 20th century science, in my view. And, uh, and uh, these uh, together, absolutely refuted the Google AI of panic, you know, that somehow AI was gonna usurp human minds and, and uh, take over our jobs and leave us oceos on beaches. That whole vision is, uh, is just ridiculous. And uh, it's really an uh, alibi for the left to, to uh, um, explain away the devastating impact on employment of uh, leftist programs to s suppress uh, industry and, and uh, enterprise in the United States. And uh, uh, it's just, you know, the campuses are all sicklied over by a pale cast of green goo, which uh, all know how to stop stuff but have no no idea of how to start it. And so uh, we're everybody surprised when IPOs, initial public offerings in the United States, shrink 90% over 20 years. And, uh, and uh, the number of 
public companies in our stock market drop almost 60 percent. Uh, the interest rates disappear. The, you know, we haven't had a positive real interest rate in in decade in a decade. It's uh, you know it's it's really a, a, a kind of cartoon capitalism that's being contrived. Trump is battling against it as best he can, but he also has this bizarre sort of view that the Chinese are guilty for the green goo and the paralysis of our uh, manufacturing. And it, it's a good political, people like to think uh, some foreign machinations are responsible for our own failures, but the fact is it's, it's our own failures. So th the incentive system of uh, capitalism as chiefly an incentive system really falls apart completely when you really look at it. Uh, does Mark Zuckerberg or Larry Page really need $85 billion or whatever it is they, they have uh, as a motivation to go to work at Facebook? I mean, it's, 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 it's really silly. Uh, uh, under capitalism, uh, capital f flows not to those most eager to spend it, but to those most able to expand it. And uh, uh, the capital owned by rich people has to be husbanded and managed, and most, most, most of it is illiquid. If they sell it, it drops in price uh, faster than it grew in many cases. Uh, faster than they can uh, harvest it. It's it just it's that's it's not an incentive system. It's an information system. Wealth is knowledge, and uh, that's the chief proposition of the information theory of economics. Wealth is knowledge, and uh, if you uh, uh, if you think about it. Uh, as Thomas Sowell, the great Thomas Sowell, has thought about it, uh, the Neanderthal in his cave had all the same material resources we have today. The difference between our age and the Stone Age is entirely the accumulation of knowledge. Uh, of, uh, Economist at MIT of all places named Cesar Hidalgo wrote an interesting, interesting book the other couple years ago called "How um, Why Information Grows" or something like that. Why? Anyway, he he said it had a different way of dramatizing how uh, wealth is knowledge when he said when a expensive car crashes into a wall, all its value disappears, though every atom and molecule remains. Value is information. The car is knowledge. Wealth is knowledge. That's what it is. And if it's, if it's not knowledge, it's not really wealth. It's a manifestation of power or government uh, intervention or whatever. So that's, uh, well, real wealth is knowledge. Growth, meanwhile, uh, poses a question, what is economic growth if wealth is knowledge? Well, economic growth is learning. Uh, that's the increase of knowledge is learning. And this is really where I came at this theory first, uh, when uh, after writing Wealth and Poverty, I was invited to Bain and Company to speak, and I became a friend of Bill Bain's and hung around the Bain offices for some time. And Bain and Company was entirely founded on what's called the learning curve. They uh, they didn't call it the learning curve because their competitor Bruce Henderson and the Boston Consulting Group called it the learning curve. And so they called it, the Bain Company called it the experience curve. But what it was, 
was the tendency of costs to drop by between 20 and 30 percent with every doubling of total unit sales. And, uh, as, and this was a result of learning. And, and uh, Bain and Company and the Boston Consulting Group collected data across all industries from uh, insurance policy dollars to microchip transistors to eggs, poultry eggs, uh, chickens, uh, trucking miles, lines of software code. It didn't matter what industry they scrutinized, they found this learning curve, the 10, 20 to 30 percent drop with every doubling of, of total units. And, and uh, they really showed Moore's Law before Moore's Law, that Moore's Law is really a learning curve. It's, uh, it seems to be different. That's Moore's Law of semiconductor and computer number of transist transistor densities on chips. But uh, Moore's Law seemed to be radically different from a learning curve because it just because the number of transistors multiplied, multiplied at such a fabulous pace that it resulted in this faster uh, descent. But essentially, Moore's Law was another learning curve. And so, and this is not a coincidence that uh, these curves of learning are evident all across the capitalist economy. It's manifest the fact that wealth is knowledge and growth is learning. But learning has particular rules that it has to follow. It was essentially, the theory was essentially expounded by Karl Popper uh, when he uh, asserted that any scientific proposition has to be couched in a way that it could be refuted. You know, if, it's, uh, if it can't be refuted, uh, it's tautological or it's circular or whatever, it, uh, it, it doesn't represent a science, scientific proposition. Climate change, uh, which can't be refuted, it China, whatever change in the climate occurs, it's uh, the result of changes in the climate. Uh, uh, is not a scientific proposition. Uh, but uh, scientific propositions have to be refutable. Uh, capitalism is based on entrepreneurial propositions that are falsifiable or refutable or can fail. They're bankrupt. They can, bankruptcy is possible. And because bankruptcy and failure is possible, you can have Popperian learning. And thus you have, have, as a result of entrepreneurial creativity across the economy, you have uh, millions of experiments that can go wrong and uh, yield, yield knowledge. And, and uh, almost all economic policy is based on defying this fact. Uh, almost all economic policies is an attempt to guarantee outcomes. And uh, if, you guarantee, if you try to guarantee outcomes, guarantee growth, you prevent growth. If, because of the gar government guarantee prohibits the kind of learning process that, that constitutes growth. So, uh, so all government guarantees are almost, by definition, self-defeating. They, they prevent growth anyway. They can, uh, you can guarantee what exists to continue to exist for some limited span. But, but uh, in, in general, the effort of, of governments to use knowledge, uh, to use power to uh, create knowledge is, is generally futile and self-defeating. So, so uh, uh, capitalism is an uh, information system, and, uh, and uh, government guarantees prohibit its, its success. And the uh, entrepreneur is a creative figure 
in the image of his creator. That's the essential way to look at the entrepreneur. It's real creativity. It's not just a, a matter of a function of chemical elements and material uh, pressures. It's, there's such a thing as real creativity in the universe. And as uh, uh, Albert Hirschman of Princeton said, uh, creativity always comes as a surprise to us. If it didn't, we wouldn't need it. And planning would work. Socialism would work. Uh, and uh, uh, creativity is uh, really the essential force in capitalism. And it always comes as a surprise, so it can't be planned. And it yields learning and the growth of, of knowledge and wealth, and that's that's the that's the essential model, and um, but and uh, what? How much time do I got now? Before questions, okay. So I guess uh, I've done. Uh, uh, wealth is knowledge, uh, growth is learning, and uh, like to uh, extend it to the third. A principle, which is that money is time. And this is, uh, 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 is uh, a, a crucial part of the information theory of economics that I didn't really uh, discover until uh, after writing Knowledge and Power. So knowledge is time is not in knowledge and power, really, which is my first big take on the information theory of, of capitalism. But um, the clue for uh, was discovering what money is. And, uh, and uh, Jude Wineski, who is a great uh, self-taught economist, uh, who wrote editorials for the Wall Street Journal for years and wrote a book called The Way the World Worked, almost got it. He, really, he got much of it, most of it, uh, but he, he didn't quite uh, crystallize all the ideas. But uh, the essence of it was that uh, uh, Winiski understood that the reason gold could be the dominant money for centuries and centuries, 300 years of the gold standard, is not that it was, is a commodity or that it's useful for, gold, for uh, jewelry uh, or uh, conducting electricity or the various utility arguments for why gold could be money or its divisibility, or its uh, concentration, or you know, all the various theories of why gold was the only really successful money for uh, 300 years are really launched by uh, Isaac Newton. It was one of, it may have been Isaac Newton's greatest accomplishment, which is saying uh, an amazing thing for uh, perhaps the greatest physicist in history. He also uh, f devoted the last uh, 30 years of his life to enforcing and, and justifying and, and uh, the gold standard as master of the mint in Britain. He was, became master of the mint in 1696 or whatever and uh, devoted his time both to enforcing uh, the gold standard and proving that gold could not be uh, hacked or gold could not be uh, created from inferior metals so that it was uh, a completely irreducible basis for world money. And, uh, and he's launched the gold standard, and Britain led in the gold standard. And so the British um, 
banking system and economy uh, dominated the Netherlands, which preceded it as the great banking system because uh, Britain uh, carried forth the gold standard. Well, why was gold? Gold gives us a clue, a crucial clue of what money is. And, uh, and most people believe money is notional. notional. It's a subjective value uh, somehow fostered by the culture or by the central banks. Or th there are all sorts of theories of what money is. Uh, but the right theory is that money is a measuring stick. And money has to be scarce. Uh, in order to enable trade-offs and allocations and decisions about investments and interpretations of prices, money has to be a, money, a, a measuring stick. And to be a measuring stick, it has to be, as, to be tied to some permanent physical constant. And, uh, the permanent physical constant that remains scarce when everything else becomes abundant is time. And, and this, uh, and Winiski's insight was that the reason gold prevailed was that it canceled capital and technology. In other words, the more you, more technology you devoted to mining gold, and the more capital you invested in mining efforts, the uh, deeper the gold would become, the more attenuated the loads, the more uh, uh, difficult to extract it. And uh, by happenstance, over the centuries for gold, uh, not only did all the gold accumulate inexorably and never disappear because of uh, uh, Newton, Newton's alchemy as, that uh, identified the permanence of gold, that it couldn't be contrived from other elements effectively. So uh, gold, if, so the increasing difficulty of mining canceled the increasing effic efficacy of mining, technology, and capital, leaving gold as a measure of the time it takes to extract it, which hardly changed in 300 years. So uh, that is, uh, and, uh, and if you think about it in the way um, economists think about uh, basic issues like this, you think of a barter economy and you imagine what would uh, determine the values of different items, coconuts and apples and houses and axes or whatever in this barter economy, spears and fishing poles. And uh, largely what would determine uh, relative valuations is the time it took to produce all these items. Uh, that would determine how available they would be. And so from the beginning in a barter economy, you, you have time as the critical element. And uh, what uh, money does is translate the fundamental scarcity of time into economic transactions and, and becomes a global measuring stick, just like all the other measuring sticks that make possible trade. And, uh, uh, you know, like the second, the meter, the kilogram, the degree Kelvin, the lumen, the ampere, the, all these physical constants that uh, allow uh, microchip designed in Tel Aviv to be manufactured in Taipei and uh, assembled into a system in Shenzhen and uh, marketed in Cupertino, all that allow these global supply chains, the same, technolo the same technology allows 
uh, also uh, applies to money, which uh, is a critical element in international trade and renders prices uh, coherent across different economies. Today, we have uh, uh, the biggest industry in the world economy since 1971, when Nixon left the gold standard, is currency trading. $5.1 trillion a day of currency trading. And, uh, and uh, that's 25 times world GDP. It's 75, around 75 times all trade in goods and services. And it doesn't even uh, uh, arrive at uh, guidance for entrepreneurs, a settled money prices uh, that uh, allow trade across the world, as Milton Friedman thought would happen. Instead, uh, almost everything has to be hedged because the prices are so ir irrational and volatile that, uh, that uh, you have uh, hedging. And uh, Mundell and, and Friedman had a debate about, you know, Friedman said that, uh, said that you wouldn't, countries wouldn't have to have reserves anymore if, if you allowed currencies to float all around the world. There'd, you'd be perfect market of currencies. It'd be just a magical and visible hand everywhere. But, uh, uh, con but contrary to Friedman's prediction, and as uh, Mundell points out, uh, we need far more reserves today than ever before under the gold standard. Uh, every country has to collect tremendous foreign reserves in order to just uh, deal with the changes in prices inflicted by this circus of currency trading all around the world, the world's biggest industry. So. Um, so cryptocurrencies can solve this problem, and that's the theme of life after Google. It also can solve the problem of, uh, of uh, internet architecture and insecurity of the internet and the emergence of porous pyramids of where all the money and power and data rises to the top. And so, um, but it also, addresses the crucial issues of the morality of capitalism. Capitalism is part of the great adventure and ideas that uh, has uh, carried and carried human beings throughout the ages. Uh, the drama of human creativity in the image of their creator. And that is the, that is the essential argument for the morality of capitalism. And, it's, uh, and it really doesn't have anything whatsoever to do with greed or all these uh, carrots and sticks and everything that people uh, imagine uh, motivate the system in this kind of cartoon of uh, entrepreneurial behavior uh, that uh, widely prevails since the time of, of Adam Smith. Thank you very much. Questions, Ralph. Actually, if you could wait for the mic, it'll work better for people watching. Ralph Benko here. I just want to underscore uh, three points that George made for these young, callow youth, so that they're not doomed to repeat the history that they don't know. Uh, the first one is the U.S. Constitution provision giving Congress the power to regulate the value of is the same provision that allows them to set the weights and measures. Mm -hmm. So the writers of the authors of the Constitution were well aware of the, were explicitly aware of the function of money as the, fundamentally as a unit of account. Yeah. This is, seems esoteric, but it's very fundamental. And it's fundamental. It's, yeah. I'm just re- We're having trade wars because of money, not because of trade conflicts. It's, it's entirely it's, a monetary. If you, if you look at the uh, if you look at the uh, merchandise trade deficit, 
it started the day that Nixon took us off the gold standard and has deteriorated from there. Prior to that, under the gold standard, it was not, it was, it was not, there was well, no- Well, we had hundreds of years of uh, trade gaps, but- uh, Yes, but it was cyclical, and so- Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, it, was, yeah. It, it, it was not- no. Let's try to get to the question. No, I'm I'm under I'm I'm anchoring some points that George made, Gordon. and then I'll give it up to the questioners. Okay, uh, okay. Does anybody here, except for George and me, remember what the Dow Jones Industrial Average was on the day in November of 1979 that Reagan declared for the presidency? What? Okay, it was 814. 814, it's now over 25,000. Uh, the uh, world GDP was $11 trillion. It's now $81 trillion. Not adjusted for inflation or, or population growth, but you get the concept. What you may have forgotten or perhaps never knew is that Jude Winiski's charter document for the supply side revolution that created this 25-fold, 30-fold increase in capital value, the Dow, and this eight-fold increase in world wealth. And by the way, we are honored by the presence of Jimmy Kemp, the son of Jack Kemp, who was the quarterback who, who, who made all of this, who made the rising tide lift all boats for real. Thank you, Jimmy. On behalf of your dad. Uh, yeah. The, the charter document was called was published in the public interest. It was called the Mundell Laffer hypothesis. Yeah. It was thirty pages about the importance of monetary integrity and one footnote about the importance of cutting marginal tax rates. Yeah. All right, Ralph. We need to let other people ask questions. Okay. Well, thank you, Ralph. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, yeah. Okay, other questions? All right, well, I have one question and then maybe Ralph can ask some more. But uh, uh, one of the sort of pioneers in terms of applying what today would be called information theory to economics was Friedrich Hayek, who wrote a yeah. series of, I, of articles, uh, the use of knowledge in society is, is one in the uh, 30s and 40s that uh, I recently revisited, and they, they're, they're, they, they uh, are genuinely prophetic. And I was wondering what your take was on, on the Hayek and, and those, uh, the, his contributions in that period. Hayek is absolutely great on this subject, so is von Mises. And uh, they didn't exactly, they were all over the issue of time. They didn't exactly, um, resolve on that from my point of view. And, but uh, Hayek declared that uh, the source of all, uh, the chief root and source of all economic evil is the government control of money. And uh, that is a pretty categorical statement. Um, and uh, he understood uh, the pricing system as an information system. And, and and uh, obviously, to have a pricing system that functions and prevents this sort of constant debates over underpricing or overpricing goods that convulse the world economy today, uh, you have to have money with meaning as a measuring stick and unit of account. And uh, so uh, uh, Hayek's uh, theory of... Uh, of uh, prices as an information system and as the economy is essentially an information system uh, underlies uh, my own uh, beliefs and uh, and uh, and it's it was certainly a crucial step in creating an information theory of capitalism. This will here and then back here. Hi, uh, my name is Enrique Carnero. I'm an intern here. So when you were, 
you were talking about the view of entrepreneurs as rearrangers of material conditions and how when you were criticizing that viewpoint, were you going so far as to say that that's not true or, or are you just saying that's an unhelpful mindset? It's a trivial facet of what they do. Yes, they, they do rearrange chemical elements, but the whole uh, process reflects the creativity of human minds. They imagine things that don't exist. They, uh, they uh, uh, entertain counterfactuals. They, uh, they uh, devise mathematical formulae. They, you know, all the, the um, activities of the human intellect are not of very usefully described as reassembling chemical elements. This is somebody who's desperately committed to this vision of materialism, that everything is just random fluctuations of matter, and that uh, uh, is a crippling intellectual flaw from my point of view. And it has effects because uh, you know, it results in this kind of disdain for entrepreneurs and the belief that somehow greed is a factor in capitalism, uh, but not in socialism somehow. Uh, you, you know, it's, uh, it's all these uh, arguments for the essential amorality of capitalism uh, uh, derive from that kind of analysis that uh, Brings really from uh, the original Adam Smith disdain for men and trade, uh, who are see also seen to be converting greed into good in some um, miraculous way, uh, but that that uh, leaves the entrepreneur as a kind of amoral uh, tool of incentives and uh, makes capitalism seem like an unappetizing cause, despite its production of, of wealth. Kobe. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Kobe Williams. I am an intern here at Heritage. Um, I was just wondering, uh, so you were talking about uh, money as a scarce resource that creates value and determines like what's valuable and what's it not. measures value yeah, it measures value yeah sorry um what are your thoughts on bitcoin and maybe like the concept of blockchain just you know, with that idea in mind well i got a whole book about that uh the two books actually in various ways um the, you, you might say their titles so people know well scandal of money was the first take on it but i did not in scandal of money see the flaws of the Bitcoin model. And uh, Bitcoin itself uh, was an attempt to create uh, a digital gold. And that, that is a tremendous goal of the cryptocurrency movement. And it, uh, Satoshi was responding to the financial crisis of 2008 in the first post in the blockchain, the op return line allowed him to refer to an article in the London Times about another bank bailout. Um, Satoshi was responding to the breakdown of the world monetary system with an effort to supply a new currency that mimicked gold, and but also possessed the efficient, superior efficiencies and of the of the the digital electronics in parts, and however, because he'd been been too many spent too time but too much time in various college campuses, he imagined that resources are scarce and running out, so he uh, believed that in order to mimic gold. You had to mimic the exhaustion of the gold resource as time pass, passes. And uh, so we have this asymptotic cap on uh, Bitcoins. So there can only be 21 million ever mined. And uh, if uh, Bitcoins grew as fast as gold, uh, there would be 316 million Bitcoins 
uh, by 2141 when uh, the cap is finally uh, closed. And, but the whole idea that uh, he was just wrong, gold doesn't run out. Uh, you know, we've constantly, you know, we'll mine the oceans, slag heaps, mine the moon, mine meteors. You know, there are endless ways to uh, find gold if we want to. So that uh, this whole idea that uh, gold will run out, it was misconception, which meant that when he, desi he designed Bitcoin with this fatal flaw. And so, uh, it's capped, and it, uh, so it's become a kind of speculative vehicle and an emergency vehicle, wonderful in places like Venezuela where the economy collapses. It's, uh, you, you know, it's, it's, it's a useful item. It's good for big business-to-business -business, uh, transactions across borders. It's, it's got its uses, but it's got to be reformed. And uh, so it's, uh, it's not money as it stands because of its constitutional um, flaws. But there are thousands of efforts to create cryptocurrencies that can actually arise and save the world economy as the current uh, global monetary system continues its slow degeneration. Other questions? Hello, George. Great to be here with you and, and hear you again. I uh, just stumbled in here and grateful that I did. Well, thank you for coming. Thank you. My name is, my name is Jimmy Kemp. I run the Jack Kemp Foundation. My, my new jacket is uh, wearing out now. It's got <laughs> the holes in it. And I'm going to have to go back to the store again. <laughs> Good to see you. Uh, so the you know, the thing that we all love about your writing and, and speaking is your incredible understanding of the diamond, dynamism within human nature, the potential and dignity inside each human being. Um, two nights ago, we had our Kemp Leadership Award dinner and we honored Sean Parker, who came up with uh, the yep. kind of fulfillment of Kemp's Enterprise Zones, which understood that our tax code Totally screwed up. Um, that what? That our tax code, which is is and has been completely screwed up, yeah, yeah. And, and doesn't foster the right. human dynamism in which we believe. Um, but okay, let's take advantage of how complicated it is and provide a simple uh, way to incentivize people to invest in communities where people have not had those opportunities, yeah. distressed communities. So now you've got opportunity zones. That is an optimistic understanding of human nature um, that in which we believe. Yeah. What, what are the most critical steps that, and, and what do we need to emphasize with political leaders? We, before we honored Sean Parker, we had Senator Ben Sass give remarks uh, about the state of politics and the world and culture. Talk a little bit about uh, what came across in Senator Sass's remarks was a pessimism uh, with all the challenges that we face in our culture. Uh, you know, the, he talks about the loneliness of human beings that is, he thinks is diminishing our ability to come up with solutions to the problems that exist versus policies that are optimistic. Senator Tim Scott was with us, and uh, it's, it's interesting in our conservative movement, we, and we've always had it, pessimist versus optimist, um, how do you view those types of discussions and the critical policies that can help return us to that correct understanding of our human nature with all of its flaws, but potential and opportunity? Well, I think that's a wonderful statement. I, I would, uh, uh, and and I'm, I'm quite optimistic be, because uh, uh, when you, not only is the whole cryptocosm of decentralizing the world economy again from its current phase of, of uh, centralization, but uh, also all the groups in the world that uh, really believe in marriage and family and that tend to be uh, believe in the 
in the human soul and possibility are having babies. And uh, the uh, people who don't believe in uh, the human soul and uh, in the creativity and of human beings are having abortions. And so the combination provides a path for uh, the conservatives to ultimately triumph in current coming decades. All right, any other questions? Ralph, do you want to make one more? Oh, back here, I'm sorry. No, we got a question over here. We got a, I'm sorry. All right, uh, Brian O'Quinn, Heritage Foundation. Uh, I don't, I'm not an expert on cryptocurrency, but I see a current problem with Bitcoin, and I see the great benefit of fiat money being that we no longer have to rely on on gold. We can, you know, just the money is printed on paper. Paper yeah. is cheap. Yeah, but gold allows that. I mean, that that happened. The only reason people were willing to accept paper money, fiat money, originally was that it was uh, based on gold. That's what uh, made fiat currency possible. Paper, all well, this efficiency possible. Going to the question, I guess, that I was going to ask about uh, blockchain, it seems like it's somewhat inefficient to devote all these computational and energy resources towards solving the blockchain problems, which are, if I understand it correctly, are just finding a nonce, such that the hash of the, the uh, transaction record and whatever your nonce is, is less than X. I mean, can we, are there newer cryptocurrencies that can solve, I guess, a more useful problem than picking a random number that solves the current transaction record? Well, there are two. Uh, the, um, you know, I, the focus on, on energy consumption, I think, is a preferred uh, response to the general green goo. But uh, any, I mean, uh, the energy consumed in $5.1 trillion a day of currency trading uh, is at least uh, exceeds the energy p consumed in uh, mining bitcoins. But uh, that's really beside the point because uh, um, the current Bitcoin model has been adjusted and changed and rendered more efficient and, and, uh, and a, a whole array of uh, new currency proposals are emerging that uh, use other methods than the Bitcoin proof of work to uh, attain consensus across uh, the uh, system. And so, I, I, I mean, there, the Ethereum uh, system is currently in a transition. Ethereum was started by Vitalik Buterin, it's, it's one of the great entrepreneurial stories of the history of capitalism. Uh, he, had, he launched a new blockchain called Ethereum. He based it on uh, to, uh, to uh, enable a new global computer platform to conduct smart contracts, a whole set, um, crucial among them, initial coin offerings uh, that have already uh, redressed the US IPO crisis with uh, $20 billion of, of money for 2,000 new companies in the last 12 months in initial coin offerings based on a new currency that he launched called Ether that in turn is, finds its value metric in uh, the energy consumed by uh, the smart contracts. And uh, that metric's called gas. And, now, and that's, a, that's the, the most widely used blockchain outside of Bitcoin. And, and it is uh, being reformed now. Ethereum 2.0 is called Serenity, and it has a new, simpler language. It has sharding, which increases its efficiency thousands of fold. And, and, uh, and it's trying to adopt a proof-of-stake model uh, to replace the 
proof of work model. We'll see. Uh, proof of stake is not as secure as proof of work. If you really got to run through a tremendous amount of computation and, and energy usage in order to establish your um, uh, new transactions or your fraudulent transactions, you can't consummate them. So, so proof of work, Satoshi was right that it is the ultimate uh, kind of uh, security foundation. Uh, I believe that it will probably be possible by ingenious cryptography and their other uh, to uh, simulate proof of work without uh, actually requiring it. But it's a, it's a conundrum. It's not a, but there are thousands of efforts to, uh, to do proof of an, uh, memory usage, proof of computer uh, capabilities, proof of distribution. There are a whole, there are a whole set of ways uh, devoted to uh, um, eliminating the big energy lo losses entailed in uh, current Bitcoin mining. I think there's too much effort to do this. The whole world economy is uh, twisting itself into a futile pretzel in order to avoid a global warming crisis that's totally trivial and unimportant. Well, thank you. Uh Sure. As the greatest living Yildirologist, I want to encourage- That would be you? That would be me, yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, and uh, Joy, I will My not be- My daughter has a so. Well, she and I can uh, arm wrestle over who gets the <laughs> title of the greatest living Yildirologist. And what about if Kiana back there? Okay, well, well, we'll have a tournament, winner take all. Uh, Jack Kemp used to say, he used to quote William Shakespeare uh, and uh, from, from Julius Caesar, uh, there is a time when taken at the flood leads on to fortune. For those here who want to know how uh, Jack Kemp and George Gilder and Jude Winiski and Jeff Bell and a hand... Uh, uh, Bob Mundell and Art Laffer essentially took America from misery and stagnation and launched a wave of epic economic growth that has never been par paralleled in history. Then read Life After Google. Or if you simply want to really understand what's going on in the cryptocosm, you know, George invented the telecosm and he invented the microcosm and he's now coined the cryptocosm. If you'd really like to know what uh, Bitcoin is about and Ethereum is all about and the entire sector is all about, I've read virtually every book out there as the senior counselor to the Chamber of Digital Commerce, which represents the sector. And Life After Google is head, head and shoulders above the rest, both explaining how and what, not just use cases, but why it will reveal the big reveal according to George's uh, prophecy, and he's prophesized correctly many times in his life, in, in, uh, we're, we're on the cusp of uh, experiencing the World Wide Web in virtual reality uh, in, and, uh, and in company of one another as opposed to a flat screen. That's thanks to the blockchain. Yep. Okay, Otoy. Yep. Okay, we are on the cusp of I, I was, uh, there's a lot of hostility toward right. Google and Facebook uh, among the conservatives for obvious reasons, but the solution is not regulation. Absolutely. It's innovation. And the innovation of the blockchain is going to make, uh, thanks to Blockstack and thanks to the Brave browser and basic attention tokens, is going to make us partners of Google rather than inventory of Google. So this is the prophecy that you will learn from Life After Google, and, it, it, and it's a ripping great read, starting with uh, the, a trip through, uh, to, uh, 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 back to the future, Hill Valley, 
and uh, a virtual reality ride to, wow. to uh, through a Tyrannosaurus's uh, uh, <laughs> oh. teeth, which George got the first uh, prototype of. The end. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. This concludes our Thank event. You, David, for the invitation. No, I appreciate it.